thank you very much for uh, coming along. So um, I'm Professor Viviana Wathrich. Um, I'm going to talk to you today about how we might maintain good mental health into older adulthood. Hopefully that's the talk you're expecting. <laughs> if not, that's fine. I won't be offended. You're very welcome to leave now. <laughs> All right, so the first thing we'd like to do is just do um, an acknowledgement to country. And we actually have a little video to play, so I'm just going to pop that on now. Yama, Warami, Wilimbimbi, Warami, Minika, Warami, Turuganura, Warami, Walamata, Warami, Wanura, Walamatiko. We welcome you on behalf of the ancestors and we acknowledge all of the elders past and present. We acknowledge all Aboriginal nations of Australia. We walk together on this land and we pay respects to the traditional owners and those who have walked before us. We acknowledge the land's history, yesterday's, today's and tomorrow's. The land speaks of the Darug and their dreaming. We can still feel, hear and see the ancient song lines across this beautiful campus. This land has held many gatherings for centuries since the Darug's first sunrise some 60,000 years ago we belong to the land. We are many nations, many people, coming together, looking after this country and respecting each other. We stand here together at Macquarie on sacred ground. As the Wallamai navigate the mangroves and find their pathways, so shall you here at Macquarie. Warami, welcome to Wallamata, do you go It's beautiful, isn't it? Now back to my boring slides, I think, after that. But anyway, um, so as I said, thank you very much for, for coming. Hopefully um, you will learn some things today. Um, at least I can tell you a little bit about some of the research and some of the things we're doing here at uh, Macquarie University. Um, so today's event is actually to celebrate October is Mental Health Month. All right, so a few more days of Mental Health uh, Month to go. Um, and so we actually run this as an annual uh, lecture series. So this is our ninth year learning about good mental health. Um, often it's a uh, mental health across the age span. This is the third one focused on older adults because that's my baby. It's my area of passion and I run the series so I get to choose the topic. So um, I'm very thrilled to have a third one here around older adult mental health. Um, so tonight's event is actually brought to you by two uh, research centres. The first you would know perhaps of is our Centre for Emotional Health Clinic, um, a very successful clinic that looks at how we might better identify and treat mental disorders right across the lifespan. So we're interested in prenatal anxiety and depression and the impact it has on unborn babies um, through children, adolescents, adults and into older adulthood as well. And you've actually got some information in your, your uh, brochure pack we've given you about some of our services at the Centre for Emotional Health Clinic. We also now have a brand new faculty research centre focused on research in ageing, cognition and wellbeing. So I'm actually the director of that centre and I'm really excited that we've actually been able to bring together all of our expertise across our linguistics departments, our psychology departments, our cognitive science departments to be able to think more about how we might maintain um, healthy ageing. Um, so we think about things like how we might reduce risk for dementia, we think about mental health, but we're also just interested in the ageing process in general. So there's more information, you can look this up on the website. Now you do have copies of all my slides. They are a little bit small, I'm sorry. But um, if you need an e if you want, just email me and I'll send you a, a full size copy. My email address is on the back, but you do have all of this information. All right, so when we think about mental health in older adults, why is it important? Well, many reasons why it's important. But one of the reasons why it's particularly important is because, as you know, our world's population is ageing, and in particular, our Australian population is ageing. And so although this um, graph is a little bit difficult to uh, decipher, this is from the Australian Bureau of Statistics, this demonstrates the projections of the age, um, the age of Australians over the coming years. And so the very lightest bar, which is that light grey bar, which you can see is kind of more out to the sides in the bottom um, part of the graph, shows the number of um, the, the demographics, the age of people in 2002. 
So that's where we were in 2002. And what you might see is that there were more younger people and less older people. All right, so we see those gray, light gray lines becoming less prevalent as we go up the age group. By 2051, you can already see some pretty dramatic changes. Okay, so that's the medium of the dark bars. And you can see this big shift. So in fact, what we know is that, let's see on the next slide, I actually tell you, um, we know that by 2051, over a quarter of Australia's population will be 65 years and over. One quarter. Woohoo! <laughs> yeah? <laughs> no, it's not scary. It's going to be great. It's going to be great. <laughs> yeah, that's okay, but I'll, I'll be in that bracket, so I won't be one of the ones helping you guys. <laughs> I'm, do I'm doing my job now, okay? <laughs> So this is why we have to be mentally healthy, right? Because who is going to help us? So one quarter of Australian population will be over the age of 65. But at the same time, people are going to be living longer. So we actually know that um, by 2051, the um, ABS is uh, uh, projecting that 5 to 7% of the Australian population will be over the age of 85. At the moment, it's less than 2%. So we're going to live longer as well. All right, so we want to really make sure we maintain really good health because we're going to be living for longer. So I think this is why we really need to make sure we pay lots of attention to the issues affecting older adults, mental health being one of them. So in, th in terms of thinking about mental health, I've got a question for you. Is it normal to be anxious and worried and nervy, grumpy and irritable in late life? Put your hands up if you think yes. <laughs> he says, speaking, speaking from experience. <laughs> Put your hand up if you think no. Ah, the no's have it. And so this is one of the things I want to change your perception around today, okay? Because this is what is actually going to help us to maintain better mental health individually, but also as a population. So it is true that we have, of the mental disorders that we have, Anxiety and depression are our most common, all right? So things like substance use disorder becomes less prevalent, um, but anxiety and depression are our most common. However, the rates actually decrease. So for um, older adults, one in 20 Australians aged over 65 had an anxiety disorder or a depressive disorder uh, in the past year, and that's when it was surveyed in 2015. That is much less than we have for younger people. I'll show you a little graph because I do like graphs. So this is um, the prevalence of this. This is Australian data in the last National Mental Health Survey that, that they did, which was in 2007. Um, and the lightest of the bars you can see there are our anxiety disorders. So that's the one on the far left. Okay. Then the middle one, the dark colour, is affective disorders, which are mood or depressive disorders. And the third bar, which I know is a little bit hard to distinguish on this slide, are substance use disorders. So alcohol use or drug use, for example. And what you can see with all of them is we see quite higher rates from the you know 16 year olds, 25, 35 year olds, and then look what happens after the age of 55. Anxiety disorders really start to come down, and so do the mood disorders. I think this is when you enter the golden years. Okay. So we actually start to see better mental health is actually the norm for older people. Now when this data first came out, some people queried this data and they said, well that can't be true, we all know old people are grumpy and anxious, right? <laughs> and besides, this survey, you didn't go in and measure all the people living in residential aged care, they're all, they're all grumpy and, and depressed, in fact, unfortunately a lot of them are, that actually, actually is true. But even if you include those people, it doesn't change the data very much. And so then some people said, well, we all know that if you have anxiety and depression, you're more likely to die young, right? So all the dead people aren't included here, <laughs> right? That's why they're not in this. But that's not true either, because with clever statistical modelling, we can account for all the people who we think might be dead, <laughs> who have anxiety and depression, and we can put them back in, and we can see that still, we actually do expect better mental health as people get older. 
Now, this data is, is true if we look at the individual anxiety disorders. Okay, so this is panic disorder you may have heard of, social anxiety, which is a fear of meeting new people or fear of what people think of you. GAD, which is generalised anxiety disorder, people who worry chronically. PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, separation anxiety and a specific phobia. But again, you can see the same pattern of results. The yellow here are the over 60 year olds. And you see again, this decline in all of the anxiety disorders with age. Now this data is not unique to Australia. This data is replicated in the USA, in Canada, in, um, in uh, did I say the UK? Anyway, US, Canada, Australia, there's a few anyway. <laughs> the same pattern of results is there. Okay, So we do find better mental health in older adulthood. I have spent quite a bit of time trying to understand why that is the case. Um, and I'm going to tell you a little bit about why that's the case, but that's a whole other presentation. So I asked you, is it normal to be anxious and depressed in later life? No, it's not, and we shouldn't expect it. But if it does occur, then we need to treat it. All right? It's true that sometimes older people do feel worried and nervous and they do feel low and grumpy and irritable. Sometimes it's because they've been like that for a long time, all right, where they've experienced anxiety and low mood for long periods of their life. Sometimes it happens for the very first time as an older adult. And when that happens for the very first time, often it's because of some kind of triggering factor, something has happened. Sometimes it's true that it can be neurological all right, that might be the, the onset of some cognitive changes. But most of the time, it's actually due to just life stress, something that's happened. And the really common things that bring older people to experience symptoms of anxiety and depression are when there's a change in their physical health, they develop a new health issue, or three or four, and they start having to have the handfuls of pills. That can impact on people's self-esteem and, and worry and their mood. If people are experiencing losses, so changes in their relationships, if they have a spouse or a family member pass away, or just lots of people that they know, friends who are dying, that can make them really reflect on their own life and that can also cause anxiety and depression. If there are changes in their ability to be independent, we know retirement is a trigger for, for men. Some men find retirement very difficult. There's a real loss of purpose, loss of identity, loss of social networks that can happen. Um, changes in income, self-worth, mobility, um, all these sorts of things, uh, social isolation, having to move, all right, so having to move from houses, moving into a care facility, um, or having to take on a carer role are all common triggers for anxiety and depression in older people. We know it's quite common after an admission to hospital, right, because of a health condition, for there to be changes in people's um, mental health, and also, as I mentioned, cognitive decline. When anxiety and depression are not treated in older adults, although it doesn't, that's not the norm, we definitely have to do something about it. All right? So when older people continue to experience from anxiety and low mood, we know it causes poorer physical health, increases their disability, increases their morbidity, they're more likely to die, increases the risk of suicide and self-harm. We know it means that they start having to use medical services a lot more and a lot more medications and that increases costs. We know it actually increases risk for dementia, to have ongoing untreated symptoms of anxiety and depression. And also increases the chance you'll be prescribed a benzodiazepine by your GP. Benzodiazepines are commonly used to treat anxiety, but unfortunately they also increase the risk of cognitive decline and dementia. Right, so we can kind of set up this cycle. But we know that we can treat depression and anxiety in older people. So these are just examples of the clinical trials we've run here. These are my clinical trials. Um, we, some of you have participated in these, so thank you very much. Um, we know that we can treat anxiety and mood symptoms through group interventions. We know we can treat them in face-to-face -face interventions. We know we can treat them people over the telephone. 
we can treat them by sending people a work a workbook that they work through themselves and get a few very brief 15-minute calls from therapists once a week to check in how we're going. We know that treats anxiety and depression. And we're now developing internet intervention to treat older people via the internet as well. All right, so we know it works. There's lots and lots. It's not just from our clinic, all around the world. We know that we can definitely do things regardless of people's age. You can be 85, you can be 90. We can still use the same techniques to actually improve symptoms of anxiety and depression. But do older adults get the help they need? No. Why not? Lots of reasons. There are some common barriers to getting mental health treatment in general right across the lifespan. The common barriers are things like the cost, right? You have to be able to pay for treatment sometimes. You might not know where to go and get help. Some people experience a stigma. They don't want to admit to it. They don't want people to know. It's true that all people, all ages, prefer self-help. People would like to be able to do something for themselves in the first instance before they go and get professional help. And there can be waiting lists for services too. And so we know these things get in the way of people getting the help they need. But in fact, there's other things that are unique to older adults. So for older adults, we know that having a fear of being given medication they don't want is a particular barrier that stops older people from talking to their GPs about the symptoms they experience. Now, medication is is one way that anxiety and depression can be treated. But there are also other ways using psychological interventions. And so we want to be able to educate older people that they have some choice and they should talk with their GP to make the best decision about what's best for their needs. Right? This shouldn't be a reason for not having anxiety and depression treated. We also know that transportation becomes a big problem to being able to access services as people get older. So if, if you can no longer drive, or you're only comfortable driving in your local area, then it makes it really difficult to be able to access the services of a psychologist or a psychiatrist, right? So we know they are particular barriers. But this is, I think, the interesting part of the story. It, the other reason why older people don't get the help they need is, in fact, they are referred for psychological treatments much, much less than younger people. So in the United Kingdom, when they were, had sampled a population, they knew how many people had an anxiety or a mood disorder, and then they looked at how many older people had been referred. Less than 50% of those that had identified as having an anxiety and mood disorder with their GP then walked out with a referral for psychological intervention. And in the UK, this is quite startling because they have free psychological treatment that they've been rolling out for the last 10 years. So there was no excuse as to why these older people couldn't access services. In the USA, we know that the, those people aged 75 years and above are also the least likely to get help. In Canada, they're also the least likely to get help. In fact, the rates go down the older you are, from four, about 4% down to about 3% by the time you're aged 75 and older. In Australia, 20, only 23% of older people who have an anxiety disorder or a mood disorder are referred for help. Hmm, so why? Why? Well, part of the issue is that it's under-identified. So it's not recognised when someone has anxiety or low mood and as someone gets older. And it's also under-treated when it is recognised. So there's a study done in the US of general practitioners and they found that the reason, um, well, they found that patients tended not to report the symptoms to their GP, so therefore it was not being identified there. They mentioned the fact that GPs are very busy, and if you go in and you've got multiple health issues, you're on multiple medications, GPs use a lot of their time to go through those health checks first. There's kind of then not much time to check in around mental health and to talk about what needs to happen there. There is some evidence that the way people um, look, the way the symptoms present as you get older when you have anxiety or when you have depression is a little bit different. And so it kind of gets missed. All right? I'm going to talk about how you recognise that in a moment. But for me, the most startling thing is that there are attitudes 
It's not just GPs, it's also psychologists and counsellors and broader allied health. It's also older people themselves and the community. Attitudes where people think it's normal for older people to be a bit worried, a bit nervy, to not want to get out of the house, to be grumpy, to be irritable. And people think it's normal to feel like that if you've got some health issues. So you can see in the GP's mind, you know, you might be a bit grumpy and they go, yeah, well, you know, you lost your wife a couple of years ago and you've got a couple of health issues, you know, fair enough. But not fair enough because not all older people who experience those, those challenges have depression and anxiety, right? So there's a lot of dismissing that happens. Unfortunately, the same research has been done in psychologists, Australian psychologists, and it's the same thing. All right? Even psychologists who haven't been well trained in how to work with people, you know, older people, age, over age 60, like what, more, about a quarter of the population, um, have these attitudes all right, where they miss. They miss anxiety and depression and they don't feel optimistic about being able to treat it. But when I sampled, and some of you probably were participants, so thank you very much for your data. I do try and put it to good use, as you can see. Um, when we sampled some people who come through our clinic, we actually asked them, is this the first time you've tr sought help? And why haven't you sought help before? And 50% of them said, well, I thought it was normal to feel like this, given my circumstances. So the older people themselves were not putting their hand up and saying, hey, I don't think things are right. 30% said it was just because they were old, their age. That's why they, that's why they hadn't sought help, because they thought that's what you're meant to be like when you're older. Nervy, worried, grumpy, sad. And 12% said, I talked to my GP about it, but my GP said, oh, no, you're right, it's normal. All right? Now, it's also true there are other barriers to seeking help for older people. It's true that they want to help themselves. All right, 43% 43 43 said, I'd rather help myself than go and see somebody. That's why I haven't come for treatment so far. All right, and then we see some of those common things that I talked about before, costs of treatment, fear of being medication. All right. So what are the solutions? Let's start to get positive about things now, okay? <laughs> we need to help improve the recognition of symptoms. We need to increase willingness to seek help from professionals and we need to improve access to self-help interventions and I'm going to talk to you about how, what things you can access to help yourself in just a moment. So what does depression look like in someone who's older? Well, it looks pretty similar actually to younger people as well. The, the couple of differences, if you like, is that like young adolescents who experience depression, they often don't walk around saying, oh, I feel sad and feel tearful. They actually just feel irritable and grumpy. I saw that. <laughs> Someone just got nudged in the, in the ribs there. <laughs> but this is this thing, isn't it? This grumpy old man syndrome, like, oh, he's just old, he's grumpy. Well, I want you to reconsider. I want you to reconsider that this is not a low level of mood, that's not quite where it needs to be. All right. So that's what we need to look out there. We know that in older people it's very common when they're feeling down is to stop having the motivation and the interest to do the things they used to do. So not lying, I mean people can lie in bed and say I feel terrible, I feel sad, I feel depressed, I feel hopeless about the world. That is very true. But there's a lot of older people that kind of have much more mild levels right, where they just lost the interest to, you know, do the woodwork project or fix up the house. Yeah. For what period of time would you say Yeah. Correct. Correct. So when we think about formal diagnoses, a psychiatric diagnosis, um, the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual says symptoms need to be present more days than not, most days for at least two weeks. So basically most of the time for two weeks, all right. But that's a rule of thumb and I don't think you have to be too worried and we don't have to be worried about whether it's someone meets diagnostic criteria or not. If people have these symptoms, we just need to do something about them. Does that make sense? We don't have to wait for it to get really bad. Okay? That's normal. That is normal. It is normal to feel down for a couple of days. It is normal to feel down for a week if something big happens, all right? 
that's normal. I guess what I'm wanting you to think about when people are feeling like this for quite a long time, you know, months go past, people aren't doing the things they used to do, they've dropped out of some of their social groups, just don't have the motivation anymore to get out and walk on the beach. That's real key that something might be wrong. We also know that when it's more severe, people will be very hopeless about the future, hopeless that things are going to work out, hopeless that their health is going to improve, and they might feel very helpless think there's nothing much they can do to help or to change the situation and there's nothing that anybody else can do to help as well. It's common to have fatigue and to have poor sleep. When we think about anxiety, it's not very different again from young people. All right? But it is the most common sorts of anxiety in older people uh, are fears about meeting new people, fears of being judged, All right? worried about what people are going to think. And it can stop people from using hearing aids. It can stop people from using walking aids. It can stop people wanting to go and learn new things in case they look stupid or old. And when people get worried like that, it can, it can actually stop them doing the things they need to do to actually stay healthy and well. But the most common sort of worry we see is, is, is that worry, excessive worry. The people who worry about everything, they're worried about the kids, they're worried about the grandkids, they're worried about the neighbours. They worry about what's happening in the community, they worry about the environment, they worry about the news, they worry about their finances, they worry about their health. Do you know these people? <laughs> and they find it really hard to stop worrying. And they might do things to try and relieve their worry, like check their blood pressure multiple times a day. Oh dear, yes. Or when the, uh, the global financial crisis was on, multiple checking of the, uh, the finances, ringing, ringing their brokers all the time. All right? They are indications of excessive worry. Because like we are talking about before, it's normal to feel down every now and then. It's normal to worry, right? Things happen, we worry, we find it hard to sleep for a few days, maybe a week or two, it's pretty stressful. But it should kind of abate if it's always some new crisis, always something where there's lots and lots of worry and it's hard to sleep, it's hard to stop that worry, then that might mean there's something we can do about it. Maybe things have gone a little bit into the abnormal and we can do something to help. It's common as people get older to have um, some phobias of situations, fears of lifts that might not have had before, fears of falling. All right? And to have a fear of falling, you don't actually have had to have had a fall to develop a fear of falling. All right? And we weren't the first study. There was a study done in the US, but here at Macquarie, yes? Oh, when they're older? Yeah. yeah, so there you are. There you go. That is true. We have to be careful with fallings. We're talking about the fact that as you get older, there is more of a risk of falling off a ladder. Yes? So that sort of falling we do have to be very mindful of. But I guess what I'm referring to here is when people don't want to get out of the house anymore because of fear of falling. Yeah? So which stops them from being able to participate in their community because they're worried they're going to trip over uneven surfaces. Yeah? Yeah. Um, so one thing that older people do do that sometimes makes it hard for people to realise that they're worrying is they'll say things like, oh no, no, I'm not worrying about it, I've just, I'm just quite concerned, I'm just quite concerned. I've got quite a few concerns about the way my daughter is raising her children, I'm quite concerned about my health, but I'm not, I'm not worried, oh no, I'm not worried, all right? So that's the, so we're going to look for the grumpy old men. I mean, look for the concerned <laughs> older ladies. Okay. All right. So we've actually so as I said, one of the things I want to do to help improve mental health for older people is help them to get better at recognising symptoms in themselves, in their family, their friends, and for um, you know family members to recognise it in their elder uh, um, older adults. And so we've actually just finished developing with the help of Jessamine and Carly, we're seeing over here, and Denise, who's somewhere around as well. Um, in conjunction with Beyond Blue, a resource to recognise anxiety, anxiety, worry and low mood. So you've got one of those to take away. You can, I think, get, download more from our website, but um, possibly also now from Beyond Blue as well. So take that away. We've also developed a brochure for GPs to try and get them to be a little bit more aware of thinking about when an older person comes in and they have lots of health issues or whatever and you're also seeing some of these sorts of symptoms. Make sure you're screening for their mental health. 
Because right? if we want to improve mental health for older people, we have to get better at identifying it in the first instance and not ignoring it and not dismissing it. We have mailed it to all GPs in, a, in how many, 250 or something, in our area. It's also being distributed out of UNSW. It's also a resource now available on the Beyond Blue website for GPs. So look, you know, I'm working on it. <laughs> I'm trying. If you have some GPs, hand them around. <laughs> okay, all right. But yes, yeah, slowly we're trying to get these resources out and about. I've got one that I can talk to you about. Yep. Yep. Excellent. All right. Yes, and, and we have actually done a study with Parkinson's because Parkinson's is one of those illnesses where rates of depression and anxiety are actually really high um, in both patients but also in carers. So we actually ran a study. Um, it was one of the studies I showed you before with, uh, funded by Parkinson's New South Wales. I'm very lucky to have a, a small grant with them where we were actually again able to demonstrate really big improvements in symptoms of depression um, in particular. And that was based on telephone calls, brief telephone calls to people. All right. So again, this, you know, as we're developing these interventions, we're trying to look into different populations and say, okay, what can we do now in this particular population? How can we improve um, treatment for them as well? So thank you. So let's talk a little bit about where you can get some help, and then we're going to move on to how do you continue to maintain good mental health. So because people like self-help, there are some self-help options available. There's not a lot. Um, you can certainly go to places like Beyond Blue to get um, resources. Um, your Brain Matters, uh, which is part of uh, Dementia Australia, have resources you can download about how to maintain good mental health there. Um, and MindSpot, which is um, actually located on campus, offers internet interventions that you can go and access to treat anxiety and depression for older people as well. And I'm going to tell you about other things you can do in just a moment. There are face-to-face -face options, all right? So G GPs are good referrers, all right, to psychologists and psychiatrists. Um, all the ones in the local area know about our Centre for Emotional Health Clinic and they should know about our trials. We have personally sent them a letter. If they don't know about us, just give them another copy of the form, please. Um, you can also get refer yourself. You don't have to go via GPs through the local um, through the mental health line. The number is there. You can self refer to see psychologists, and there's the number for our clinic as well, which is he located here on campus. But if you're concerned about a relative, a spouse, someone you know, then you can offer to go to the GP with them to talk about the concerns that you're having. And the first step can often be having a conversation where you say to them, "I've noticed that you're." You kind of seem to be like you're a bit annoyed like a lot lately, you know? I'm kind of ignoring you a lot. I don't mean to, but you seem pretty irritated. What's what's going on? All right, so you can actually talk about the behaviour you, you observe to get a conversation started around that. Because sometimes it's going to take a few conversations to get people to recognise that they're not they're not quite as happy and as easygoing as they used to be. All right, what can you do? Now, what are the things I want you to, what's your take, my take, take away message, I guess, from today? So we know the normal kinds of common sense things that we should all be doing, not just for our mental health, but also for our physical health as well, all right? We definitely know exercise is an important part of maintaining good mental health. And it is both cardiovascular and weight-bearing sorts of exercises that are good. Good for mental health, good for physical health, good for reducing risk for dementia. All right? So if you're not doing that, these are definitely things you need to put in there. 
whether that's enrolling in a professional, like an exercise class, or whether it's just making a really regular commitment to do some, you know, regular walking or playing that game of tennis or whatever it is that you might, might need to do. Of course, as your um, physical limitations might, you know, come and go, or as you age, you may have to change the sorts of exercise you do. All right, so you may need to talk to your GP about what's appropriate, but definitely exercise is an important part of maintaining good mental health. You should aim for being in the normal weight range. I'll, I'll just leave that there, okay? <laughs> we also want normal blood pressure, right? So you need to make sure you're having, if you need to use hypertensive medications, you're talking to your GP about that. There is evidence to suggest that your diet is important for maintaining good cognitive health, right? So reducing your risk for dementia. And of course, if you maintain, if you reduce your risk for dementia, you're also risk, reducing your risk for anxiety and depression. Those things often go together. And it's the Mediterranean diet that at the moment is the, uh, the hot diet of choice for good brain health. Low levels of alcohol use. Um, as, you, as you age, your tolerance to alcohol reduces, so you actually need to drink less than you used to. Maybe we'll also leave that one there. Um, we'll move on. Adequate sleep, okay. And mental stimulation. All right, so we know the more active you are in making sure you're learning new things, the better for your cognitive health, but good for your mental health too, because it makes you feel more um, effective as a person and it's good for your self-esteem to be out learning new things. All right, so you might have heard, you know, it is good to do some Sudoku and do those sorts of things, but actually that's not quite enough. All right, it's actually trying to learn all sorts of different things. All right, learning languages, learning, going, you know, learning music, anything though. Coming tonight, this is hopefully mentally stimulating. None of you have fallen asleep, so I think I'm doing okay so far. Right, but these are opportunities to learn, all right, and that actually helps us to maintain our mental health. You also want to keep building your emotional resilience to, to the challenges that might come as you age. So if you're feeling like you're going through a rough patch, you need to talk to your family and friends. Get them to help you generate solutions to problems that you might be having. Talk to them about your concerns. Ask for help. Because if they can activate a change, then the sooner we can take away those symptoms, then the better your mental health, yeah? It's much harder if you let symptoms go on and on and on. Because the longer you start to feel down, then the more you start to withdraw from your activities. The more you spend time in bed, the more you stop socialising. And then your depression gets worse and we set off this terrible cycle. All right, so if something's bothering you, have those conversations sooner rather than later. Don't avoid difficult situations or places that make you feel nervous. All right, so there might have been some people who would be worried about coming here today because they wouldn't know how to get to the campus. They wouldn't know where to park. That's not a reason not to come. All right, give yourself more time if you're nervous about it, but don't not come to events. Do not stop doing things that are good for you that you enjoy. And we see this is something that older people do. As they start to feel more nervy, they start cutting back on some of the activities and the places that they go because it's too challenging, it's too stressful, something might go wrong. But unfortunately, that actually maintains that worry and that anxiety and makes you feel like, oh, maybe I can't cope, maybe I can't do it. Yeah. So we need to stop that. And I think as a community, we often encourage and reinforce older people for staying in their own home more, not getting out so much, but we need to do the opposite. We need to be really encouraging them to engage. You need to keep active doing the things you enjoy. All right, if you're a sailor, try and sail. If you can't sail anymore, go watch the sailing, right? Do things, don't stay at home and do nothing. Do things, get out, um, keep up your hobbies. If you don't want your hobby, pick a new hobby. Keeping busy is a really important part of maintaining mental health. And you need to try and keep things in perspective. Like at all stages in life, you can ask yourself, what else have I coped with before that shows I can get through this? Because I think by the time, you know, I think about all the challenges I've had personally, and then I think, wow, by the time I'm 65 or 70, I will have had double what I've already had, right? <laughs> I'm gonna have a lot more. And I hope to be able to think back and think, well, look what I've coped with so far. I'm sure I can use some of those skills to cope with whatever those new things are that are coming. And I think this is partly why 
older people do have those lower rates of mental, mental disorders, like I talked to you right in the beginning. I said to you, older adults should have good mental health. There is some research that tells us that they are actually a bit more resilient. They are actually do have good coping skills because they've learned a lot over their lifespan. They are actually better at taking a positive spin on things and saying, oh, well, we'll wait and see what happens. It might be all right. They're naturally inclined to do that. So keep your perspective. Remember you've coped with things probably worse before. Think about what advice you would give a friend in this situation. We're all pretty good at giving advice. Often we're not very good at taking it. So if you won't take your wife or your husband's advice, at least try and take your own. All right? What would I tend to tell a friend to do if they were feeling like this? Do that then for yourself. Okay? You'd rarely tell them to go and bury their head in bed and avoid all of their friends. Um, and ask yourself, does this happen to other people? Because, of course, all of those challenges I talked to you before are very common in, as um, people age, and so it's very likely that someone else has lost a spouse or had to move house or had problems with their health. Now, the other thing that we know is really super important for mental health is actually maintaining good social connections and social participation. Um, so, in fact, not only does it, is it good for mental health, but it's also good for physical health and it reduces uh, risk for dementia. So being part of social activities, so being a member of a religious group or a social group or a community group, you want to do those things. Volunteering, it doesn't have to be volunteering that you do as a social thing, but we do know that volunteering plays an important role. It's better, um, gives you better perceived health, gives you a better sense of well-being and life satisfaction and has been associated with less risk of death, depression and um, needing healthcare services. Now, I know volunteering is easy to say. I know it is hard to get volunteering gigs, and it doesn't have to be for everybody. But I think the point is about trying to do things where you feel meaningful, maybe you're giving, but also that social element is very important. And in fact, there was this study that was just uh, put out by, the, uh, by Harvard. It's the Harvard Study of Adult Development by um, Charles Reynolds there. And they found the key to happiness at age 80. They look back through all of the data they had. They've been following these people for a very long time. The happiest people at 80, they found the big, strong relationship with the number of connections they had with family, friends and their community when they were 50. The point being that maintaining social connections is really important for all of us in mental health Right? It's important as we age, but it's important we're doing that earlier on in our um, adulthood too because these are the connections we often maintain into late life. But it's never too late to, join, to make friends. All right? So you don't have to just be friends with people you've been friends with for 50 years. Um, if you're anything like my mother, she can make friends like that to anybody she meets. <laughs> New best friend. All right? But hey, it's probably good for her mental health, right? So do maintain those relationships um, and, you know, relationships take work. It means you have to call them up sometimes. You do have to go and meet up to have coffee. But I think the thing that's great about relationships and friendships is you can rekindle them instantly. You know, like I have friends that I haven't spoken to for 20 years and I can call them up and they'll be, it's just kick off from like where you were 20 years ago. All right, so it's important to maintain those connections, build new ones and rekindle old friendships in order to have good mental health. All right, so in summary, the things we've talked about. It's not too late to improve mental health. And you, things you do for your mental health will probably improve your physical health and your cognitive health as well. See you. The things you need to do is you need to make sure we're recognising the symptoms of worry and low mood early, not ignoring them, not saying they're normal, not putting them down to the health struggles that are a normal part of ageing, but actually recognising that they're there and then doing something about them. All right, whether that's self-help, you might want to start there, whether it's getting professional help. But we don't want to leave them go on and on. You maintain your good lifestyle habits, like we talked about, the exercise, the diet, not too much alcohol, being careful about our weight, all right, not smoking, but keeping active, physically active, mentally active, socially active. So let me tell you very shortly about current research. So we've been very uh, fortunate that we've been funded for, in fact, two clinical trials which we're running here in the Centre for Emotional Health. They are co-funded by our National Health and Medical Research Council and Beyond Blue. 
have some collaborators at University of Sydney, New South Wales and Macquarie Uni. One of these programs is focused on improving our current in interventions for treating anxiety and depression in older people by also looking at ways we might be able to um, change their social participation. We're trying to see if there's a difference there. When people do more social participation, what are the effects on anxiety and depression symptoms? Um, both the treatments that we're using are our cognitive behavioural therapy, our Ageing Wisely program, some of you have been through before, but this is the one that we've now established with a number of clinical trials. We know it works. We're now just saying, can we make it even better than it, exist it is existing? Okay? This is an 11-week um, um, program in this particular trial. In the past, it has been a 12-week program, one hour a week. People come in face-to-face, one-on-one with a psychologist, learn some of these skills we've just been talking about. They learn about um, how to solve problems. They learn about how to keep their activities up. They learn about how to sleep better. They learn about how to reduce their avoidance of situations. Um, they, they learn about improving communication to maintain their social relationships. They also learn about changing negative thinking. We are recruiting. Doesn't mean you, but maybe people you know. 65 years and older is the cutoff for this particular study. Experiencing some low mood, worry or anxiety. We will assess them here, but I guess um, to make sure they meet criteria. People do need to be able to come face to face here. In fact, the clinic is just through that door. But there's more information on the email, but you also receive some brochures. I think this one is the brochure about that. All right. We have a second one, which we're not recruiting for right here, but I just thought I'd tell you very briefly about it. Um, funded um, also by NHMRC and Beyond Blue, very similar collaborators there. This is what we're calling the STOP trial. This is a multi-site trial. So we're trying to improve access to mental health services in rural parts of New South Wales too. So Orange, Dubbo, Bathurst, Prince of Wales Hospital at Sydney, and our own clinic here. And so we are trying to um, improve access to mental health treatments there, starting with um, more self-help types of interventions, which is uh, a workbook, which is a work at home, very much version based on the other versions we've had before, supported by phone calls. And we now have this new internet treatment, which we are working on. And I know some members are here were part of a focus group that gave us some early feedback on that. So I appreciate those of you who are able to help with that. So that's pretty exciting. Um, it means we get to go out to Orange very often. And we did get to visit a winery just briefly the other day, which is very nice, I just like to say. There have got to be some perks of research. There's not many. Okay. Well, see, I was driving, so I actually only had to—I had to choose my four my four sips. So I had—I was good. I was good. <laughs> um, we are very much trying to make sure that in our research and in our clinical trials, we're getting consumer feedback. All right, so we do run focus groups where we ask people about what they think of our manuals, of our programs, of our research design, what they think the most important problems are that we should uh, we should tackle. Um, and if any of you are interested, we are very keen to have more people in those sorts of focus groups that gives us some feedback about, about our services, about our things. We also do um, are very interested in running other research that's not clinical trials, just about understanding well-being and ageing in general. Um, we have questions about you know, how, people, how does reading change over age, for example, or how can we measure anxiety differently or better in older people? Um, or, you know, how do we eradicate fear using, um, you know, laboratory sorts of uh, mechanisms, all right? So there's all sorts of projects that we do. Um, and we do like to have people who would volunteer their time to come in and let us test them on various things um, very nicely, okay? No, nothing too evil. But if you're interested, I know quite a number of you are part of that. I really appreciate the uh, service that you've given. If you're interested in doing that, there is some information there about this one about how to sign up. You might do some online surveys for us, come in and, and do some studies for us. Um, this is one of them, people measuring anxiety in people over 60. There's a flyer about that too. This is an uh, online survey asking people questions just to try and help us better um, differentiate anxiety. And that's actually it for me, so I can take some questions. So thank you. Uh, hopefully that was informative, told you reaffirmed what you already knew, but hopefully gave you some new ideas as well. And um, again, I appreciate your support. Thank you.